Today on Applied Science, we're going to be doing some nuclear physics. I want to show you this little known technique of doing chemical identification that works even through a sealed container. So we're going to put the sample in a coil of wire and transmit and receive and determine what chemical is in the coil. A pretty cool technique, and in this video I'm going to show you the practical side of building the spectrometer itself, the RF tuning and isolation techniques, uh, tuning it with a nano VNA. And then I'll talk about the nuclear physics, what's actually going on with the particles, and just the first step of quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's see a demonstration of this whole thing. I'm going to start the transmit process by pressing the burst button on the oscilloscope, and what this is going to do is uh, create a transmit pulse using the scope's function generator, which then gets amplified and sent down to the box here, amplified and then put into that coil of wire. Then there's gonna, the scope is going to delay about 200 and so microseconds and then start to receive and collect everything from that coil. And what we're looking at here is a spectrum, a frequency domain of what we got back from the coil. So pretty big spike there, and this is coming from sodium nitrite, which is the chemical that I've got loaded into that coil. And sodium nitrite has a characteristic frequency at about 3.6 megahertz. And this frequency is universal. So if we were talking to, you know, intelligent life forms on the other side of the galaxy, they would also agree that sodium nitrite has a resonant frequency at 3.6 megahertz. And the cool thing is, we wouldn't have to know anything about the periodic table or physics or constants or anything as long as we agreed upon a time, like what a, you know, a hertz is or what a second is. All of these NQR frequencies for all the compounds in the world are the same across everywhere, universal. So currently the signal we're getting from sodium nitrate is actually quite high and every time I press the burst button, it's a single experiment, so we're not averaging anything here. But what we can also do is turn on averaging. So we'll do like 10 shots, and each time the um, experiment runs, we're just averaging the frequency trace over and over again. And so as we do more and more averages, you can see that the noise goes away, and hopefully the signal stays high. And there you go. Okay, so now you might be thinking, well, if we're transmitting at such a high power at the same frequency that we're looking for, maybe it's just the coil still ringing down. So what we'll do is take out the sample of sodium nitrate and put in a sample, another nitrogen compound, urea, and we'll run the burst. And as you can see, there's no hint of a signal there from urea. And we'll put in some table salt, which doesn't have nitrogen in it at all. And you'll see why I uh, keep saying nitrogen, because that's going to become a, an important thing. And if we go back to the sodium nitrite sample, the signal is so high, by the way, that we don't even need the box closed. We're actually getting enough signal even in one burst. Uh, it's pretty obvious that it's there even in a single shot. Uh, if we're looking for a much smaller signal, it seems to be going down a bit there. But if we're looking for a much weaker signal, it might be down in the noise. And so then what you have to do is close the box because this is a really sensitive instrument and then average a ton of, uh, of readings to get anything, to look at it through the noise. So as it happens, sodium nitrite is just very strong and it's a great way to test if your system is working. But if you're looking for something uh, you know, more mundane, something more difficult or something that you might encounter in the real world, uh, you might need more advanced, you know, techniques to get the signal out. Keep in mind that we're transmitting it maybe 10 or 50 watts and we're receiving it picowatts and so the <laughs> the amount of signal loss is pretty massive and that's why it requires all this weird RF stuff in the copper box and everything. Let's talk about that weird RF stuff. Here's a system plan and you'll see that the entire thing is driven by the oscilloscope. So the function generator within the oscilloscope produces the transmit pulse, which is about 100 microseconds at 3.6 megahertz, and we feed that right into a power amplifier. This is the blue piece of equipment sitting on the bench there. And by the way, this was kindly donated by a viewer named Ian. So thank you very much, Ian. And we're actually operating your amplifier a little bit outside its frequency range. So even though it's rated for plus 56 dB, uh, the fact that we're outside the range a little bit means we may not be getting quite that much gain. But nonetheless, we're probably at around 25 watts for the uh, transmit pulse. And everything in the circuit from here to here is 50 ohms. So we send this 50 ohm, 25 watt uh, pulse out into here, and we use this matching capacitor. This is one of those variable, uh, variable vacuum capacitors that you saw in the box. And we feed that into this parallel 
LC resonant circuit. And the L in the parallel circuit is the sample coil. So this is that coil of wire that's holding the test tube. And it's about 25 turns. And we use this relatively thick wire because we want a very high Q. Um, when you read articles about NQR and this, this technique that we're doing here, everyone talks about getting the Q of your, of your sample higher and higher. As it turns out, there are other facets of this thing that might be even more important than the Q of the probe here. But the reason that it's a thing that you might want to worry about is that the higher the Q of this resonant circuit, the easier it is to detect a very weak signal. So what we want to do is detect just the tiniest amount of, of magnetic variation within that coil. And if our Q is really high, that means it can sort of build up a high signal because you've got this really resonant circuit ready to kind of uh, store up energy from this very weak uh, signal that we're going to get from atomic nuclei, right? So it's not going to be very strong. So that's kind of the transmit side. And then we take the signal and feed it into a 60 dB low noise amplifier and then put it right back into the oscilloscope. So you can see we get a, we're going to have some problems here if we built it as is. We've got 25 watts coming out and then it's sent right into this uh, sensitive low noise amplifier. So it would immediately destroy the amplifier uh, if we set it up this way. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to separate the transmit and the receive channels. And we could use a transmit receive switch, like a physical relay or something, that would work. Uh, but the problem is that our timing is pretty critical. So we've got this 100 microsecond pulse, and then we want to wait maybe one or 200 microseconds and then start receiving right away. And timing a physical switch to within you know, tens or hundreds of microseconds is not going to be that easy. So we could also use a solid state switch, like an active switch, a pin diode or a MOSFET or something like that. And those are good choices, but as it turns out, there's a completely passive way to do it. What we're going to do is build a circuit that behaves differently, whether it's um, passing high power or low power. And here's what it looks like. Uh, this technique is uh, well known. It's called like a lambda over four technique, a quarter wavelength technique. And I first learned about this on W2AEW's YouTube channel. Alan has a ton of RF videos, and I've probably learned more about RF from his videos than anywhere else. And uh, there's also some good sources that I'll put in the description that discuss um, how this relates specifically to magnetic resonance or, or nuclear resonance experiments. But the idea is that we want to have a circuit that behaves like it's closed when it's in the receive mode, and we want this whole thing to behave like an open when it's in the transmit mode. So when we're transmitting at high power, this whole thing will appear like an open. And when the transmitter is off, this whole thing will appear like a short. One of the interesting properties of a transmission line, a piece of coax that happens to be a quarter wavelength long, is that if you short one end of it and then test the other end electrically, it will appear to be an open. And this is just a property of waves uh, propagating through a transmission line, a piece of coax like this. So at the frequencies we're interested in for this experiment, 3.6 megahertz, a quarter wave length of uh, coax would end up being somewhere on the order of 20 meters. And so this technique would work. You could just coil up 20 meters of coax in there. And, and, and this is actually done professionally in NMR laboratories sometimes. But there's an easier way to do it. Uh, instead of using coax, we're going to simulate the piece of coax by uh, using an inductor and a capacitor, a parallel capacitance and a series inductance, which if you think about it, is really what a transmission line is. There's a center conductor and there's a whole bunch of capacitance distributed along this thing for, to the shield. And there's a whole bunch of inductance because it's a wire going through there. And so we're going to basically use the equivalent inductance and capacitance of a quarter wavelength of transmission line. And the way that you calculate these values is pretty cool. So the reactants for both the coil and the capacitor should be 50 ohms. And if we check it out at 3.6 megahertz, that's 2.2 microhenries for this and 880 picofarads for the capacitor. So now here's where the interesting bit comes in. We simulate this quarter wavelength of coax. Then we put crossed diodes at the end of it. So this means that when you have a high power going through here, uh, the diodes will be forward conducting and they will essentially act like a short because we've got a huge amount of power coming through here. When there's a tiny amount of power coming through, it's not enough voltage to forward bias the diodes and they appear not to even be there. So in that case, 
the signal just comes right through. It doesn't really interact with this at all because we aren't changing the impedance at this point. It just sails right through. And since the world is so full of non-idealities, you actually have to have multiple stages of this to get enough isolation. Remember, we're looking at such a tiny signal and transmitting at such a high power that if you only had one stage of this quarter wavelength with the cross diodes, um, too much signal still gets through, potentially even enough to destroy the, lo the low noise amplifier, but certainly enough to overwhelm it to the point where it won't be usable for another, you know, <laughs> couple milliseconds. Or in other words, our signal's going to be gone by the time the amplifier reco re recovers. So we just put stages of this over and over. So here's another quarter wavelength and another quarter wavelength, and we put cross diodes at every um, junction. And you can even um, put more diodes in parallel. It doesn't have to be two. You could even do four, two forward and two backward, basically. And all this is doing is to increase the isolation, make this thing behave even better, uh, more performant, basically. These diodes are 1N4148s, so they're very quick, and their junction capacitance is low, especially low compared to the 880 uh, picofarads for each one of these quarter lambda things. So that's how, the, that's how we protect the low noise amplifier and um, keep it from being overwhelmed right after a transmit pulse. But we still have another problem here. Even when we aren't transmitting, there's a small amount of noise coming out of the transmitter. And so as you can see, there's a direct path from the output of the power amplifier right into our sensitive circuit. And at these low uh, voltage values, I mean, you know, microvolts or nanovolts even, we're going to be amplifying in that, and that's exactly the range where our signal is going to be. So unless the power amplifier is quiet down to the nanovolt level, which of course it isn't, then this, we're completely overwhelmed. You're going to be looking at, you know, all kinds of interference. So the last bit of the circuit is an isolator for the transmit side. And again, we're using cross diodes, but now they're in line instead of uh, going to ground. And so the idea here is that when we're not transmitting, these diodes will not be forward biased, and they essentially look like an open. When we are transmitting, the diodes are forward biased enough to conduct power, and it looks like they're a short. So it seems like just cross diodes all by themselves would be enough, but we have another problem. Uh, when the diodes are uh, open, when they're not conducting, they still have junction capacitance. Quite a bit, actually. It could be as high as, I mean, large diodes could have a huge amount, but even small signal diodes can have 5 or 10 puff of junction capacitance. And guess what? That's a problem. Even at 3.6 megahertz, it's enough to get noise or interference from our power amplifier into our ultra-sensitive LNA. So what we again have to do this like three-stage trick where we're reducing it at each stage, and then between the stages, we just put a resistor to ground to give a, a path to drain off more of that um, interference that we don't want. So if we've got a capacitor, remember capacitors at AC do have some you know, conductance. They, they do pass the signal. So then we have to put a resistor, and we're basically dividing this, dividing this noise signal or this interference at every one of these stages. And I found that three stages of each is enough, and uh, it, it does work actually completely passively uh, with this layout. One challenge is that you have to retune the uh, lambda over 4 part for every frequency that you want to investigate. So at 3.6 megahertz, I said the value is, you know, 2.2 uh, microhenry and 880 puff, but if we switch to 2.5 megahertz or some other frequency to investigate a different material, then we have to rewind the toroids and retune this entire thing. You have to be careful because if we transmit at the wrong frequency and this quarter lambda um, thing is not tuned for the right isolation, I mean, if we're, we're, we don't have the right circuit for the right frequency, we can blow out the LNA, of course. So you got to be careful about that. And you do have to spend time retuning unless you have a more advanced technique. So while we're talking about tuning, let's try to actually do it. Let's retune the circuit from 3.6 megahertz, which was the sodium nitrite frequency, and let's change to 2.56 megahertz, which should be paracetamol or acetaminophen. So what I'm going to do, or what I've already done, is disconnect the transmitter and receiver, and I've connected the nano VNA to that tuning port that I have there. So the only thing that the nano VNA is connected to is the matching capacitor, the tuning capacitor, and the coil. And so we're going to change the knobs. This is, this is the knob for the tuning capacitor. This is the knob for the matching capacitor.
And I'll zoom in so you can see the nano VNA screen and uh, what, to, what to expect there. Okay, so here's our circuit currently tuned to 3.6 megahertz. And the yellow trace is showing the return loss going into our setup there. So there's a, a big dip right at 3.6 megahertz because it's absorbing a lot of the energy right at that frequency. The green trace is the Smith chart showing the complex impedance that we're uh, testing at this port. And the blue trace is the Q. And it's funny, it's actually uh, shown as one divided by the number. So the lower the, the trace and the blue thing, the higher the Q. And it currently says that we're about one over 0.015, sometimes it's 0.02. So the, the loaded Q or the matched Q of that circuit is about 50. So if we turn the tuning capacitor, we can very quickly change the resonant frequency and it's very sensitive. I'm only turning this thing, you know, this is about a half turn right here. It goes clear across the screen. So what we'll do is change the range. We wanna get down to 2.56 megahertz. So we'll change the start frequency to 2.4 and I'll start turning the tuning capacitor and we're slowly walking the the dip on that yellow trace down. We aren't worrying about the matching capacitor just yet. That's about 2.56 but as you can see we're not matched very well. So one the dip is not very low so we aren't absorbing very much energy. Um, the Q actually looks surprisingly good but the Smith chart is also way off so we want to get the green marker so that it's right in the middle of the Smith chart, 50 ohms. So if I start turning the matching capacitor, it makes the green circle bigger. We're getting it closer to 50 ohms, but now we've detuned the circuit a little bit. So it's an iterative process where you're turning both the tuning knob and the matching knob. And we wanna get um, 50 ohms right in the middle of the Smith chart at the same time that we're getting the biggest dip possible. So let me go back and forth with the knobs here a little bit. Okay, I think that's pretty good. We've got uh, 48.9 ohms. Obviously, 50 is as good as we can get, pretty much. And we're right at 2.564 megahertz, and the Q is quite high, 0.01 over 0.01 even. Um, that's just going to be as good as it's going to get. Also, this vacuum variable capacitor was generously donated by Kenneth, and it's been sitting on my shelf for years just waiting for its moment. So thank you, Kenneth. Okay, so we've got the correct 2.56 megahertz isolation circuit installed. We've used the VNA to tune the two capacitors, and we have one more thing to do. We need to use a magnetic probe to find out what the field strength is inside our coil there, and this will make uh, getting the pulse strength and length correct. So uh, this is a, a single turn of coax um, that has the end shorted and a little cut made in the top. And you can look up magnetic field probes, but I basically have this connected to the green trace on the oscilloscope. And what I'm gonna do is put the probe right in the coil and then hit the burst button. So we just transmitted and I have a measurement set up and it's measuring this length of more or less consistent voltage coming from this probe. And it's 2.6 volts, which is a bit higher than I want. So I'm shooting for a specific power level that will become uh, obvious a little bit later, but we're gonna turn down the amplitude at which we're transmitting. So instead of 240 millivolts, let's do 200. And then if we burst again, we can see we're getting less magnetic field strength. And so the, the amplitude that the AFG is sending out to the amplifier is just getting boosted by that power amplifier, goes through the circuit and creates a magnetic field in that coil and we're measuring the strength of the magnetic field using this magnetic probe. We could calculate it, but it's much easier to just measure it because then we know what we've got. And we're down to about 1.9 volts, but we want to be a little bit lower still, 1.5. So that's about what we want. So I'll put the magnetic probe away, and now we'll actually start uh, running the sequence to see if we can see the signal from paracetamol. Here's our tube filled with the pills, we'll just put that in there. And then what we'll do, so you can see that this is the transmit pulse uh, that we're showing. And you can see the pink trace is what we're getting from the LNA. And it's completely overwhelmed from the start of the transmit pulse to about 250 microseconds. So what we'll do is just roll all this back so that we're only looking where the thing has stabilized and then hit burst. Now we can see here that we're still getting some of the recovery from the LNA, and there's this very broadband peak 
uh, that, that's, it, that's the coil ringing down. So what we'll do is slide this a little bit more along and burst again so that we're only inspecting a clean signal. And we're, so far we're not seeing anything. That could be something. I'll start playing with this and averaging it to see if we can get a signal. I might have to close the lid too. While we're collecting data from the paracetamol, let's talk about where this signal actually comes from. So imagine we've got uh, an atomic nucleus here, and it's got protons and neutrons in there, so the net charge is positive. Recall that there's also this property called spin, and the subatomic particles that make up the nucleus uh, each have a spin, and they combine together to give a net spin to the nucleus if, if there is, if for certain materials. And remember that if you've got something that's charged and it's spinning, that's kind of like a little bar magnet. It creates a magnetic field. So the nucleus of lots of different atoms is like a little bar magnet. And if we were to put this in an electric field, it would not really try to rotate because it's a magnet. It's not electrically, it doesn't have an electric moment. But if we put it into a magnetic field, then it would align. Just like we have these uh, compass needles are aligned with the Earth's magnetic field. Same thing. So I'll show you another property that's going to be relevant here. I've got this uh, toy gyroscope that I'm going to spin up. And if we hold it vertically, not much happens. But if we tilt it and then let go, it precesses. And so gravity is trying to pull it down, pull it straight, and the gyroscope precesses uh, in response, right? I mean, that's, that's what these gyroscopes do. And this is another property that the atomic nucleus has. And so it's like a bar magnet, but it also has this gyromagnetic quality. And the rate that this thing precesses is another interesting thing. It's partially due to gravity. So if we were to take this same gyroscope to Jupiter or the moon, it would precess at a different rate because gravity would be exerting a different force on it. And so the same thing happens in an MRI machine. Uh, the strength of that magnet causes these nuclei to align with it. And if you do something to perturb the direction of these little magnets, the little nuclei, they uh, precess at a specific rate as they try to realign with the magnetic field. And that rate of precession is determined by the big magnetic field in an MRI machine. Okay, so if we are going to use this in a system, we need a couple things. We need one way to determine if the atomic nuclei are, are precessing, like the gyroscope was. So when they're twirling around like this, we need some way of detecting that. That's relatively straightforward. That's just a coil of wire. So if we put a coil of wire around all these atomic nuclei and amplify what's coming back, we can sense when they're all spinning around in unison, when they're all precessing in unison because they create a very tiny magnetic field that we can pick up with a coil of wire. A little bit more challenging is how do we precess them? How do we get them precessing in unison in the first place? You might think, well, great, we'll just transmit a really powerful pulse and really blast them into orbit. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. There's actually a sweet spot where we have to get them precessing at maximum velocity. And if we go too far with the transmit pulse in terms of power or time, then we actually blow past the sweet spot and don't get any signal. Let me show you why. Okay, so imagine this is our magnetic moment here and our nuclei is in there and it's perfectly aligned so that it's not precessing right now, we haven't perturbed it yet, uh, and everything is perfectly aligned. So now we start giving it a transmit pulse and we start to cause this thing to precess by transmitting at the characteristic frequency. Now if we just freeze frame it right here, we can see that the angle that it's making, there is an angle between the resting field and the axis of this um, precession. And remember, it's always twirling around like this, but we can always freeze frame it at the extremum and measure this angle that it's making. This is called the flip angle. So if we transmit for a long period of time, it will absorb more and more energy and flip further and further out until it's 90. In fact, it keeps going all the way to 180 degrees. So as long as we're transmitting, we're causing this thing to change its flip angle. And this is why it has a sweet spot. So if we transmit for just the right amount of time and flip it by 90 degrees, now the thing is twirling like this and we're getting a lot of signal out of it. So that's good. If we transmit for 180 degrees and twirl this thing all the way around and let go, 
now we get exactly zero signal out of it. So this is the sweet spot I was talking about. You always want to shoot for 90 degree flip angle to get the maximum amount of, of precession and the maximum amount of signal out. And as it turns out, the flip angle is just the product of the transmit power and the time that you're transmitting. So you can double the power and have the time, and it's exactly the same flip angle. This is why I wanted to measure the magnetic field that's happening inside our coil so that we know uh, what the transmit strength is, and then we can calculate the correct time to transmit to get a 90 degree flip. Now, hold on, you're probably saying. This might all be fine for MRI machines with giant magnets, but how is this working without any magnet? Yeah, so that's, that's the exciting bit. So this, so far we've been talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, which is the thing that MRI machines use to make an image. But as it turns out, some atomic nuclei do not have the charge distributed evenly. They're kind of um, oval shaped or um, oblate like this, right? So they not only have a magnetic moment, they also have an electric moment because the charge is just not spherical, right? Like it's, it's still positives, it's still positives and, um, and neutrals in the, in the nucleus, but they're just spread out like this so that if we did put this into an electric field, it would actually have a tendency to align. So the next great question is, well, where does the electric field come from? We don't have that either. All we have is a coil of wire. What's interesting is, the electric field comes from the molecule itself. So these nuclei are, are let's say this is nitrogen. It's, if nitrogen is part of a bigger molecule, there's other things around it in the molecular crystal structure that also have charge. So much further away, I mean, if this was drawn to scale, it'd be ridiculous, but nearby atoms and nearby other molecular structures will have a charge. And this thing will basically be in an electric field all the time, just because it's in a molecule. Um, you can actually see this property very easily. Just charge up a comb or a piece of plastic and hold it near a stream of water. The water will completely bend out of the way because its molecules have very strong positive and negative sections to them. It's a polar molecule. And so most molecules have uh, not perfectly even charge distribution, and that's how we can take advantage of all this. Now, one downside is that these uh, oblate-type nuclei are not particularly common. Luckily, nitrogen is one of them, and chlorine is another one. But if your substance doesn't have either nitrogen or chlorine in it, this method will not be particularly helpful. But on the upside, lots of times we want to find things that have nitrogen in it. For example, pharmaceuticals and explosives are two categories of things that very often have nitrogen. They have this oblate thing, and then we can use this technique called nuclear quadrupole resonance, NQR, I've said a few times, but that's what it stands for. So quadrupole is this shape of the nucleus that has um, an electrical non-uniform distribution. But there's another problem. In an MRI machine, the magnetic field is the same everywhere. So every nucleus is experiencing the same magnetic field. But in this idea of NQR, where we're actually using the electric field of the local crystalline structure, imagine you've got a sample like this that's you know, powder basically, or, or small crystals, that means each location is going to be oriented completely different. How could we ever get a signal out of this? Well, yeah, it's true that that is a problem, and that is one of the reasons why NQR has such terribly weak signals. Um, it's nothing compared to an MRI machine. But it does work. Uh, there is one slight concession. So if you think that the ideal flip angle should be 90 degrees, because then you get the biggest precession, uh, in NQR with a powder sample, it turns out that the ideal flip angle is about 110 or 120 degrees to compensate for the fact that all of the crystals are oriented randomly in there. And the ones that are upside down don't subtract from the signal. Uh, it's just, luckily, it doesn't matter if it's um, aligned up or down with the magnetic field or the electric field. So being upside down doesn't cancel us out, but being sideways makes the signal very weak. So we do end up losing a lot of signal to a powder sample. I've got one more trick that I know you're going to like. Uh, so far we've been talking about these 90 degree pulses and it seems like, yes, this is the best way to get signal out. If it's starting off like this, we tip it 90 or 110 or 120 degrees to get the maximum amount of precession, which is what we pick up with the coil. But this does have a problem and here's what it looks like. If our transmit 
pulse is here, and we call this a 90 degree pulse because it's of the right amplitude and the right time to tip this thing from vertical or from aligned with the field to 90 degrees, and that gives us a, a good signal. So the receive channel looks like this, where we get a signal and then it kind of dies out. The reason that it dies out at first seems like it's because this thing is precessing and then it slowly realigns with the field that's around it. But that's actually not the case. The reason that the signal dies out is because throughout the material, there's like micro tiny variations in the precession speed for each nucleus. And this has to do with like, you know, ultra microscopic temperature variations throughout the material. It has nothing to do with keeping the material at the same temperature. This is like, you know, thermodynamic variations that you just can't get rid of. And because of this, if this guy is going a little bit faster than the one on this side, they will become out of phase. And as soon as these things are processing in different ways, we lose all of our signal. If, if some of them are going faster than others, the signal will decay. And the time it takes to decay because of the fact that some of the nuclei are going faster than others is called the T2 star time. And for the sodium nitrite sample that we looked at today, that time is on the order of two or 300 microseconds. And so that's very short. And this is bad because we, we really need to switch from transmit to receive very quickly. And then we're losing the best part of the signal because it's high amplitude and then dies down. But if we can only start receiving here, then we've lost the best part of the signal. So we need to figure out a way to get around this. And there's a super clever technique. Check this out. Now we're talking about multi-pulse multi -pulse, pulse sequences. <laughs> so instead of just doing one 90 degree pulse, we're gonna do two pulses. And this is actually gonna give us a much better signal. So here's the idea. We first start with the aligned, uh, the aligned nuclei and tip it 90 degrees. So now we're getting a pretty good signal. We could record it if we want, but we, we probably won't. And then we wait a little while. The, the signal's gone because of this dephasing effect. Then we give it a 180 degree pulse so that now the ones that were spinning you know, clockwise are spinning counterclockwise. And we wait a little while longer and we suddenly get this echo a much bigger signal and much farther away from our transmit pulse so that we have time to recover and record the whole thing. And here's the way to think about this. Imagine there's a foot race, a whole bunch of people are lined up on a starting line. You start the race, some people are faster than others, so they pull ahead, they all run at the same speed, each runs at their own speed. Instead of having them cross the finish line all at different times, we stop them all at one instant halfway through the race and tell them to go back towards the starting line. So the faster ones have covered more distance, but they're running faster. So when they turn around and go back towards the starting line, they will get there at exactly the same time as the slower runners. So all of the nuclei throughout the entire sample have all these different speeds going on. And the fact that we give it a 180 degree pulse means that we compensate for that fact because we've switched the direction and we create this rephasing so that slowly they become back into phase and give us a maximum signal and then die back out again. But here's the thing, we can give it another 180 degree pulse and rephase them again and again and again. And you can easily do 10 or 20 rephasings. The only thing that limits you is it's true that as we're <laughs> flipping this thing back and forth 180 degrees, eventually we are in fact running out of of flip angle, of total angle from the thing. And once it aligns again with the field, we can't really flip it 180 degrees anymore because now it's not processing. So um, the time it takes for this thing to really run out of gas is called the T1 time. And it's much, much longer than this so-called T2 star time. Anyway, I just thought that's a really clever trick. I haven't gotten this to work at all on my setup. I haven't even attempted it yet, but uh, maybe a good one for a follow-up video. Okay, so now let's have like the one minute intro to quantum mechanics. So far we've been talking about this in classical terms of spinning and flipping and gyroscopes and stuff, but there's a completely parallel way to think about how all this is working. Uh, the idea is that when you put a, um, a nucleus into a magnetic field or a quadrupole into an electric field, some of them will align 
with the field and some will be upside down. And this is the funny thing, it's not really like a bar magnet. Obviously all of these compass needles are aligned with the Earth's magnetic field north to south. But the thing with a spinning nucleus is it's not like that. Sometimes they align that way and sometimes they align that way. And it's about half and half when you put these into a magnetic field or an electric field. And the idea is that the energy level between these two is very slightly different. And the stronger the field, the bigger the difference in energy. So sometimes you'll see it written on a diagram like this where it splits out into two. And the idea is that you started with the same energy for both um, or you started with the same energy because none of them had any particular orientation. But when you put it into a field, you split the energy levels because some will align and some will be anti-aligned. And if you measure the difference in energy between the high energy state and the low energy state, and you put all of that energy into a photon, the frequency of that photon would be exactly the same as the frequency of the precession that we were talking about. That's kind of a nice mind blow, right? Like it ties all this together. And this is actually, this idea of splitting something into two energy levels is known as Zeeman splitting. And it's exactly the same Zeeman phenomenon that I showed in an earlier video that will affect uh, optical absorption spectra. Same exact idea, magnetic field changes the atomic properties based on uh, splitting this energy level. And it's also the same thing that uh, we use to calibrate atomic clocks, as shown by uh, Curious Mark. So here's the setup I ended up with for the paracetamol, or the Tylenol. I, I ended up using a much larger area, or a much larger volume of sample, and still have got kind of inconclusive results. It's a real weak signal that's not very repeatable. So it's possible there's going to be some follow-up videos. And as always, put questions in the comments, and I'll you know, answer them either next time or, or in the comments. Um, so anyway, I, I think there'll probably be more to talk about, but I, I hope you found that interesting, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.